Well, good morning, everyone from Malibu, California. It is 1130 Pacific time. And uh, my name is Pete Peterson. I'm the very grateful Dean of Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy, welcoming you here to our last Friday session of the day, our new series of April short courses. Uh, this one will move from economic philosophy with our last session led by Dr. Gordon Lloyd. This one will move into the area of foreign policy with a true expert in that field, Dr. Robert Kaufman, our docs and professor of public policy. His uh, series over the next four weeks is titled Trump's Principled Realism and the Major Themes in U.S. Foreign Policy. Just a couple of words about these sessions. I know that some of you have uh, joined us for the first two or, or maybe one of the others, but for those of you who are joining us here as your first session, uh, we are using the Zoom online technology platform for these uh, short course sessions. The format for uh, each of these is that we'll begin with about 40 or 45 minutes of lecture uh, from Dr. Kaufman and then utilize the last 15 minutes for Q&A. I'd ask all of you to mute your microphone. Uh, your microphone icon is in the lower left-hand portion of your screen, and just by clicking mute on that, you will move to mute, but still be able to hear us here in Malibu. Um, when we move in closer to the last 15 minutes or so, I'd ask all of you who want to participate, this, these are intended to be interactive sessions, uh, to enter your questions through the chat feature. Uh, you'll see in the lower portion of your screen, there is a, a chat icon. And if you click on that, you can easily type in your question and you can direct it either to the entire group or simply direct it to me. And I'm again, uh, Pete Peterson. So being led by Dr. Robert Kaufman, as you see here, he is our Dachshund Professor of Public Policy. Uh, Dr. Kaufman is a political scientist specializing in American foreign policy, national security, international relations, and various aspects of American politics. He teaches most of our foreign policy and international relations classes here at the Graduate School of Public Policy. He is the author of several books, including his most recent, Dangerous Doctrine, How Obama's Grand Strategy Weakened America. Uh, his other publications include In Defense of the Bush Doctrine, a biography. Uh, another book, Henry M. Jackson, A Life in Politics, um, which received the Emil and Catherine Sick Award for the best book on the history of the Pacific Northwest, and Arms Control, uh, in the pre-nuclear era. Kaufman also assisted President Richard M. Nixon in the research and writing of Nixon's final book, Beyond Peace. Kaufman is currently working on a new book titled The Principled Realism of President Trump, Two Cheers. And of course, that book, which he is currently working on, sets the stage for this discussion. It is a great honor to have uh, Dr. Kaufman lead this session, and in many ways, it's a, it's a, it provides a taste to, for many of you who have not had the pleasure of joining us here in Malibu about the kinds of classes that we offer here. I know on this session that we have prospective students who are thinking about joining us here in Malibu and applying to the School of Public Policy. We also have alums and supporters and others who are interested in this subject matter, and so very glad to have you here. So you know, these sessions are being videotaped, and so for all who have registered for this session, we'll be sending you within the next 24 hours a link not only to this session, but also a link to several of the books that Dr. Kaufman will be referencing in this lecture. So that's it for me. I will now uh, turn the camera over to Dr. Kaufman, welcoming you here into LC 155, classroom here on our Malibu campus, and uh, welcome you, Dr. Kaufman. Dean Peterson, thank you, and thank you out there for giving me the excuse to get out of the house. 
I am going to be talking today about the book I'm working on, which is actually the third in the trilogy. Um, first is on Bush, second is on Obama, and this one is uh, going to be about Donald Trump's principled realism. I uh, changed the title a bit. It is Donald Trump's principled realism. Uh, it's better than it sounds because uh, one of the themes of my talk today is that the substance of what President Trump has done um, is usually superior to his rhetorical justification for it. I'm going to lay out, first of all, some uh, general themes that are going to inform my talk. And what I'm going to do today is talk at a more general level about Trump's principles approach, uh, where it falls in the uh, spectrum of other approaches to American foreign policy, uh, what's a continuity, what's different about it. Uh, I'll, I'll preview that by saying that President Trump uh, can't be confined to any single foreign policy paradigm. Yet much of what President Trump is advocating uh, has deep and long pedigree and roots. And what President Trump is offering is, is a hybrid approach that draws on many traditions and also reflects his specific temperament, instincts, and reflexes for international politics, largely rooted in his approach to uh, his real estate work in New York, which I argue is, is actually a very compelling training ground uh, for the nature of international politics. So that's one of the first themes I want you to consider. Uh, the second theme is uh, to correct some of the misconceptions about President Trump and where he fits in uh, to American politics in general and foreign policy in particular. One narrative is, and it comes from the um, progressive press predominantly, is that President Trump marks a fundamental discontinuity to America's role in the world as we've practiced it since the Second World War, uh, operating as the world's default power, uh, maintaining an equilibrium in the vital geopolitical regions of the world, Europe, East Asia, in the Middle East. This is a misconception in many ways because first of all, some of our Cold War presidents, particularly Nixon and Carter, also challenged that view of America's role in the world. Secondly, the real challenger, the challenge to the post Pearl Harbor consensus that reaches the apotheosis with Truman and Reagan and Bush 43 originated with President Obama. And one of the ironies of the uh, situation we face in international relations is that Obama and Trump on one hand approach the world in a diametrically opposite ways. In many ways, I'm going to argue that President Trump has to be understood, among other things, not just domestically, but uh, internationally, as the veritable anti-Obama. And yet, for all the differences, Trump and Obama represent two alternative approaches that, for all their differences, rest on the premise that the United States needs to modify substantially the premises of American foreign policy as it operated uh, for much of the period since 1941. So I also want uh, that um, insight to inform the discourse. Uh, here's what I wrote of President Obama. I think it's wrong to underestimate the fundamental challenge that President Obama poses. My book on Obama argues this, that President Obama abandoned the venerable tradition of muscular internationalism, emblematic of Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, 
Kennedy, Reagan, and both Bushes. Instead, I argued that the Obama doctrine paved the way for ending the indispensable role of the United States playing what Joseph Jaffe calls the world's default power. This will sound controversial to many people because during the campaign of 2016, and it's understandable how people came to the conclusion that Trump was an isolationist conventionally defined, rooted in the pre-World War II right, President Trump gave a long interview in March of 2016 that seemed to suggest that President Trump, if he became president, would dismantle uh, America's alliance structure and abandon our role as being the world's default power. He told the New York, uh, the Washington Post editorial board, for example, the NATO alliance was outmoded, it was done. It no longer served a purpose. He went on to say more controversially that, quote, um, we had never once benefited at all from any alliance since World War II with Japan and South Korea. This gave rise to the suspicion, understandable, that Trump could be understood as an isolationist. Uh, I don't think that's the case, and his actions belie that impression. What Trump wants to do is to renegotiate American engagement in the world. He accepts with qualifications that the United States must remain the world's default power. We're the only ones who can do it, and it's in our national interest in vital geopolitical regions ranked by President Trump, I think rightly, as the Indo-Pacific number one, Europe number two, and the Middle East in a dis increasingly distant third. What President Trump has argued, and I think what he has largely practiced, is that America's engagement in the world has to be renegotiated to a more sustainable position, more appropriate for the conditions of today's world, where this engagement is rooted in a firm conception of sovereignty, a firm conception of America's enlightened self-interest, and a firm conception that foreign policy although there is an idealistic component, is in the world of Michael Mandelbaum, not social work, and that the United States can no longer accept the asymmetric disadvantages that we were willing understandably to accept in an earlier period when, for example, after World War II, it made sense for the United States to open its markets while helping our allies in Europe and East Asia recover by accepting a degree of protectionism there, getting them on their feet. But to preview what I will say uh, in another session, when we deal with Europe, President Trump, and he's not the first, but he's the first really to press the point hard. President Trump is asking a hard question why should the United States subsidize the European Union, Germany in particular? Why should we allow Germany to run a $65 billion trade surplus restricting their markets to American goods while we open our markets to theirs? When Germany is now an economic powerhouse, it's not prostate. Why should the United States spend 3.6% of the GDP on defense when Germany undermines America's efforts to get Europe to spend you know, our NATO allies 2% by spending only 1.3%? Uh, and in terms of reciprocity, 
why should we defend NATO? There are some good reasons when, for example, Germany subsidizes Putin's efforts to undermine uh, NATO by building a pipeline that increases German dependence on Russia, despite the fact that Trump's move for energy independence has actually given Europe an alternative, more reliable, less expensive source of energy. Why should we defend Germany when Germany undermines the United States in our dealings with Iran, when Prime Minister Merkel is advising Eastern European member nations of NATO, contrary to President Trump, not to move the embassy to Jerusalem? So what President Trump is really seeking is to reconfigure American engagement, not to reject it, but to ground it in America's national interest in the conditions of 2020, not the conditions of 1945, 1970, or 1990. And this is a long overdue reconfiguration. Um, and in many ways, President Obama came to the same conclusion and came to office challenging the post Pearl Harbor foreign policy consensus. What distinguishes President Obama and President Trump is almost everything. And you can only understand Trump by understanding what he is rebelling against, not only more broadly our post-1941 uh, world, role in the world, which I don't think Trump is rebelling against, but believes needs to be recalibrated. Mm -hmm. He is fundamentally rebelling at Obama's response to recalibrating America's national interest. Well, what do I mean by that? One, President Obama's point of departure, the premise that explains most everything, the specific premises of the Obama approach to foreign policy, uh, can be explained by drawing a fundamental difference I use between um, President Obama and President Reagan. President Reagan thought he was um, an ordinary man leading an extraordinary, indispensable nation. President Obama believed that he was a world historical figure uh, who positively altered the global warming uh, when he received the nomination, leading a badly flawed country that could learn more from the mysterious international community than the world could learn from the principles and the actual experience of the United States operating under the Declaration of Independence and the American Constitution. And more specifically, Obama was deeply influenced, as is the progressive left today, his progeny, by the idea of J. William Fulbright, the anti-war senator of Arkansas, um, that uh, attained prominence as a senator disagreeing not only with our involvement in Vietnam, but with the entire logic of containing the Soviet Union, President Obama defined the greatest threat to the United States, not as the threat posed by our traditional geopolitical adversaries, most of them tyrannies, but by what he called, what Fulbright called the arrogance of American power. We were the problem. We weren't exceptional. On the contrary, American exceptionalism was the problem. Uh, as Obama said famously or uh, infamously at his first G8 summit in the spring of 2009, deriding the idea, yes, we're exceptional uh, the way the Greeks and the British think they're exceptional. We're exceptional the way every kid that gets an award being on a soccer team thinks uh, they're exceptional, meaning uh, it, it was not only a concept without meaning, but it was a concept that fueled a dangerous, in his view, arrogance of American power 
So that's one of the foundational principles that led President Obama to believe that cutting American military power was not only a necessity, but a virtue. And related to that, uh, President Obama embraced informing his rebellion to America's post-1941 role in the world, the idea of declinism, and specifically the version that his friend Fareed Zakaria advocated. And according to this theory, uh, whether we liked it or not, the United States was going to have to scale back on its ambitions because we were no longer going to be able to retain our preeminence because of the rise of alternative powers, specifically China, but also Russia, Brazil, uh, the powers called the Brits. And not only did Obama think that the rise of other power centers would result in American decline relatively, but he thought that would be a good thing because that would lead us not into the temptation, but deliver us from evil of the arrogance of American power. Uh, correspondingly, uh, President Obama, the opposite of President Trump, dramatically cut the American defense budget. And you're gonna say, well, what do you mean by dramatically? Don't we still spend more than the next nine nations combined? That's a misleading way to look at it. Let me give you some figures, given our responsibilities in the world. Uh, by the time Obama left office, we were spending less than 3% of the GDP on defense. That's a figure lower than what we were spending in 1940 uh, before Pearl Harbor, woefully unprepared for what was to come. As the Chinese continued during the Obama administration to pursue a multi-double-digit, multi-dimensional military buildup geared to denying American power access to the Western Pacific, if consummated, that would have rendered the credibility of our alliances nugatory. President Obama put us on a course to have a Navy of 230 major surface ships, despite the recommendation of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the 350 was the bare minimum. Let me put that in context. If we had fallen to a Navy of 220, that would have been the smallest Navy we fielded since 1916, before we entered World War I. Uh, the same goes for his desire to cut the Army and the Air Force to pre-World War II levels. And not only did we cut our forces quantitatively, but qualitatively. President Obama believed missile defense was provocative, uh, signed an arms control treaty with Russia that uh, Mitt Romney derided because it uh, allowed Russia to build and forced us to cut in limited strategic defense. But the idea was that if the problem is American power, then the solution is to restrain us because according to this narrative, it's the United States, not our enemies that have made our problems with China, the Soviet Union, and in the Middle East, a self-fulfilling prophecy. President Obama also believed philosophically in the imperative of multilateralism, to defer more and more responsibility to international institutions such as the United Nations or the World Trade Organization. And he did this for two reasons. One, he believed it would work. And two, when he understood it wouldn't work, he thought it was a good thing because that would, again, impose obstacles on American unilateralism that he deemed the greatest threat to the world. And finally, uh, it follows from premise one that if we're the problem, President Obama also believed in conciliating our adversaries, reaching out to them, engaging them, whether it was the reset with Putin that he never abandoned, uh, reaching out to Cuba, hailing the rise of China, 
uh, despite mounting concern from all of our Asian allies and even former enemies such as Vietnam that uh, the United States was inviting peril by doing that and cutting back our military forces. President Obama believed fervently that if we were the problem, we had the wrong friends and we had the wrong enemies. So the, the distilled essence of that is, and I'll give you a Middle Eastern example, President Obama believed that the United States should engage a militant Iranian regime, try to flip it according to Obama, the way Nixon flipped China, even though Henry Kissinger and George Shultz involved in that flip thought that analogy was inappropriate. And meanwhile, put distance between the United States and its friends such as a decent democratic Israel. Um, enter President Trump. Uh, he jettisons all of that. The first premise of President Trump, which is a very traditional premise, and it goes all the way back to Harry Truman, is that unlike Obama, unlike the progressive left, like Winston Churchill, President Trump believes that the greatest dangers to the United States arise, not because of the arrogance of American power, but when we are weak militarily and our commitments are not clear and credible. And so the number one initiative of President Trump to restore deterrence that he and his people believed had been dangerously eroded over the preceding eight years was to rebuild the American military. Let me quote uh, from James Madison's really superb and concise summary of the National Defense Strategy published in January of 19, of 2018. Mattis writes, we are emerging from a period of strategic atrophy aware that our comparative competitive military advantages have been eroded. We're facing increasing global disorder characterized by a decline in the long-standing rules-based international order, creating a security environment more complex and volatile than we have ever experienced in recent memory. Interstate strategic competition, not terrorism, not global warming, not failed states, is now the primary concern of American national security. Mm. This is a very traditional way of looking at the world for all of Trump's discontinuities. Trump is in a long tradition that began with the, before the American founding, during the war of the American Revolution, that the main concern of the United States is its relation to world power centers in those days, specifically the European balance of power. President Obama abandoned that. If you look at his uh, 2010 and 2012 national security statements, reiterated in 2015, there is not one single mention of geopolitical rivals such as China, Russia, or Iran. Quite the contrary. President Obama names the prime threats as phenomena. Global warming ranks number one, which is why he thought China was not an adversary, but a partner for peace. Number two was terrorism defined narrowly as a police problem, not as a reflection of a demonic ideology. Mm -hmm. And number three was failed states. Uh, the Trump people categorically rejected that and returned to a more traditional assessment of friends, foes, threats, and opportunities rooted in contemporary conditions. Let me again quote Mattis, and this is written, keep in mind, in January 2018, 
And it sounds pretty good looking at this from the vantage point of where we sit at this moment. The central challenge to American prosperity and security, listen up, is the reemergence of a long-term strategic competition by what the national security strategy classifies as revisionist powers. It is increasingly clear, wrote Mattis, reflecting the longstanding position of President Trump that China and Russia want to shape a world consistent with their authoritarian model, gaining veto authority over other nations' economic, diplomatic, and security decisions. Again, China, I quote Mattis, is leveraging military modernization, influence operations, and predatory economics to coerce neighboring countries to reorder the Indo-Pacific region to their advantage. As China continues its economic and military ascendance, asserting power through an all-nation long-term strategy, it will continue to pursue regional hegemony in the near, near term, the displacement of the United States to achieve global preeminence in the long term. And here is, I, I think, now, and when we think about this in retrospect, and it's not the only area, the area where Donald Trump defied the consensus the way Reagan and Hawks in the 70s defied the consensus about the inevitability and desirability of detente with the Soviet Union. Trump has displayed enormous foresight on China and he has defied the consensus. And let me give you some idea of what the consensus has been for 30 years spanning both parties. Uh, one view is what I call the Gray Allison, Harvard Yard, Kennedy School of Government view. Uh, and there are two variations of this. And according to Allison, in a very bad book, that according to the great sinologist and Chinese historian Arthur Waldron, who I taught with at the Naval War College, misunderstood two cities and China. Allison's argument is that China's rise to being number one is inevitable and that our goal is to make sure that that readjustment occurs smoothly without hegemonic war. That we are going to have to accept China being number one and if we play our cards right, that won't be so bad and it won't be so bad according to a fellow member of the Harvard View, Robert Cohen, because China will be socialized into being a reliable partner through international institutions, such as the World Trade and the World Health Organizations that will reflect our values. This is, this is the wisdom of Harvard that the deplorable Trump um, was going to challenge fundamentally. And another version is uh, that China seeks merely stability, not hegemony. Enter Trump. One, like Joseph Jockey and some of the honorable outliers um, to this Harvard consensus, echoed by many others in the elite political establishment, Trump doesn't believe that our best days are behind us, nor did Reagan in the 70s, when others were similarly pessimistic about our relationship with the Soviet Union. Trump believed that whether China became number one was going to be a choice of what we did or didn't do, uh, rather than an inevitability. And Trump's first premise uh, echoing the advice that Demosthenes gave the Athenians uh, after they finally took him back 
they uh, ostracized him because they didn't like his Churchillian warnings about Philip of Macedon. And finally, uh, when Philip of Macedon uh, demolished the optimistic premises of the Athenians, pursuing a policy of appeasement, they asked him, they begged him to come back and said, what should we do? And Demosthenes said, don't do what you are doing now. That is, in a nutshell, uh, what President Trump uh, has advocated about China. Let me read some of President Trump's uh, words on China. Um, you find it right here. President Trump argues that China is an existential threat that has weaponized trade terrorized its neighbors and seeking hegemony in the world's most vital geopolitical region. And not only do we have to wake up to that, but we have to view national security more broadly, not just as a military problem, which it is, hence this buildup, but an economic and biodefense problem. Trump warns about the consequence of hollowing out vital industries and allowing China's predatory economic behavior mm -hmm. to facilitate the displacement of American power in vital geopolitical regions. And what uh, should be humble to all of us with multiple degrees, me included, is that you say, yes, well, Trump made this argument. Isn't that argument obvious today, given what we face in China's responsibility for the coronavirus? Trump is writing this in a book called The America We Deserve. This book was published in 2000. Trump has reiterated this concern in several subsequent books. And to those who say, he didn't write the books, well, many public figures don't, but it's his product. And it reflects his deep-seated convictions that experience has vindicated. Now, we're in the, we're in the midst of a, a major challenge uh, with the coronavirus. And not all of the administration's steps have been adroit. And yet, it's because of President Trump that we are in a better position than we would have been in the previous 30 years, even to concede the nature of this threat, because President Trump had begun the long overdue agonizing reappraisal of our relationship with China and had moved significantly in that direction on a number of fronts. One, number one is restoring American military preponderance, dangerously eroded in general, and in the Indo-Pacific in particular, not just by spending to increase quantity, but quality, creating a space force where the Chinese were challenging us, largely because of the technology they stole during the Clinton administration. Trump has ended that. President Trump has also pushed much harder on trade and intellectual property than any of his predecessors. President Trump has revived the initiative that George W. Bush wisely began, integrating a decent democratic India into an American security system based on shared political values, a shared assessment of the Islamic threat, and also a belief in the growing danger of China. Trump has stood by steadfastly, despite his previous record, this is why it's better than it sounds, Japan and South Korea recommitting, reasserting uh, our commitment to defend Japan uh, and standing by our allies stalwartly uh, during this North Korean ongoing crisis uh, spurred by North Korea's, the rogue regime's desire to practice nuclear blackmail. It's on the China issue 
that President Trump is genuinely visionary. If you look at what Trump was saying when he was saying it, in defiance of the conventional wisdom, and how Trump has been vindicated by events for all of his missteps, this represents, in my view, the most fundamental concrete contribution in international relations that the Trump administration has made. Uh, after I talk uh, about several other aspects of Trump's overall approach, uh, I'm also going to um, point to some of the things that will outlive Trump. A couple of other things I want to emphasize, Trump's an emphasis on sovereignty. Trump believes that American security primarily depends on American power and limited coalitions of the willing based on reciprocity, not multilateral organizations like the UN giving our enemies on the Security Council, Russia and China, a veritable veto. Trump believes that national security involves retaining a large core of American productivity on American shores. Trump may not have read Adam Smith, but he understands him better than many of those people who speak in his name. Even though Adam Smith identified free trade in general as desirable, there was a major qualification national defense. The United States cannot risk outsourcing its production, 100% of its antibiotics, to an enemy like China. The United States cannot risk being hostage to dependence on China's precious metals. For all the blase sophistication of Apple, that bet all of its eggs on China, putting all of its productive capability there, allowing the Chinese to steal their technology blind, uh, coming up in the rear in the race for 5G, wondering what they're going to do now. Trump understands that American national security depends on American prosperity. And it also depends on the United States retaining infrastructure capable of discharging our global responsibilities. All this looks pretty good and pretty prescient as we face the coronavirus. So let me give you some warnings about President Trump. One, because he is transactional, I have some fears and I hope they're unfounded that he won't follow through on all of this the way Reagan would and will succumb to the lure and the art of the deal. Two, I think Trump does not sufficiently emphasize American values that are complementary to our interests, but his practice is better than how he is sounded. If you look at his reaching out to India, uh, his speech in Poland, um, his identification of tyranny as the great threat, and I hope his realization that it is Chinese tyranny that has made China uh, the evil empire of the 21st century. Uh, these are the warning signs about President Trump. But overall, whatever happens in the election of 2020, and although it is dangerous to prognosticate in general, and you can come back and laugh at me if you want, there are several things that are going to outlive Trump here where he has radically reshaped our thinking. One on China, one on two on the importance of national sovereignty, three on broadening and deepening our conception of national security to include economics and biodefense. And whatever you think, President Trump, and although President Trump may be, as Victor Davis Hanson says, like chemotherapy, we don't like it, but we need it. 
Although he may be not a man for all seasons, but a New York brawler for this one, sort of the 21st century of shame for the man who shot Liberty Valance. If you look overall at President Trump's legacy, he has gone a long way not to dismantling American power, but making it more effective, more sustainable, and more geared to the realities of the 21st century rather than in a reactionary way of trying to sustain the conditions that made a different type of response valid in the 20th century. So uh, in conclusion, in keeping with my uh, unusual pension to take positions and write books that qualify me for the witness protection program, <laughs> uh, I will defend provisionally but robustly uh, the title of my book is reconstituted. Overall, despite the warts, this is much better than it sounds and it deserves two and a half cheers. And by the time we finish, maybe even three. Dr. Kaufman, thank you so much. We will now move to uh, Q&A and we've had some questions coming in. Uh, one of the questions relates to what uh, an area, and we may get to this uh, next week um, or in one of the next sessions when we deal more with Europe, has been the rather suspect uh, relationship in the views of many that Trump has with Putin and with Russia. Um, I know that you've written on this issue. Um, tell us a little bit about your views. Is that a, is that a weak spot? Uh, as much as he gets China right, is he getting Russia wrong? That's a valid concern. Uh, Trump has contributed to that concern by his rhetoric. My response is, it's not a danger to be dismissed, and, and this concern periodically recurs. His policy on this has actually been better than it sounds. And let me put this in perspective, and I'll do more of this next week. What Trump did was not unusual. Remember, Trump didn't originate the reset to Russia. Yes. It was Obama and Hillary Clinton. And remember that they never abandoned it. Even after all of the Russian behavior culminating in the uh, annexation of Crimea, confounded all the assumptions, Obama never had a learning curve. And although periodically Trump has uh, talked better of Putin, Ergodon, other dictators, not just Putin, than I am comfortable with, and I'm a Russia hawk, look at the substance. He's deepened our commitment to Europe, reviving missile defense, increasing the defense budget, increasing deployments of American troops in Eastern Europe, giving the speech in NATO. And the number one thing is that he's ravaged Russia and we're in the midst of a war by his energy policy. His energy policy is another example of how sovereignty has put us in a position that secures us at crunch time. Imagine if we had the same capabilities in terms of antibiotics that we now have as energy. We've essentially ravaged the Russian energy program and the Iranian energy program. We've weakened our enemies by taking a broader notion of, of what constitutes national security. So. Yeah. Um, and, and periodically, unrealistic realists think you can use Russia to balance China. For reasons I'll talk about next time, it's unrealistic. You actually look at what Trump so, has done. He's actually been much tougher on Russia yeah. than Obama, than Cl Hillary Clinton would have been, yeah. and actually uh, tougher than the first two years of the Bush administration, Bush 43, when there were illusions prior to the, to the invasion of Georgia that uh, Putin was a partner to peace. So while I, I share the uh, questioner's misgivings about Trump's rhetoric and wonder whether the art of the deal may tempt him improvidently in a certain situation, mm -hmm. if you look at what he's actually done, he's fallen much closer to the hawkish end of the spectrum 
than Obama's dovish end of the spectrum, meaning if you're a Russia hawk, Trump is a much better alternative for all the misgivings than uh, Joe Biden, certainly, or mm -hmm. any conceivable opponent from the other side is going to be. Another set of questions is around uh, the issue of China that you've obviously has been the main theme of this uh, session. And I think you make a very critical point, uh, Professor Kaufman, on Trump's unique view, distinct relative to those before him, in seeing trade policy through a national security lens. So much of our trade policy and relationships with places like China has been governed by a fairly strong view that free markets are inherently and everywhere good. And certainly Trump has changed that view to see trade not simply in economic terms, but also in foreign policy terms. So a couple of the questions that we have here relate to given where we are currently with the coronavirus and you raise that issue of comparing what we've done on the energy side versus our, our weakness on say the production of antibiotics and, and other areas of our national supply chain. Do you believe that we are heading to a time after the coronavirus where we will begin to bring more manufacturing back to the United States or at least to more friendly nations in a way that won't just be governed by the market, but may have uh, the, the strong arm of, of federal government policy in doing so? Um, the answer is yes. And, and I think, Dean Peterson, you were also right to point out friendly countries. So my response, there are three things that I think and I hope happen. One, especially for a critical issue, uh, industries, uh, that this is drugs, uh, national security broadly understood, we have to maintain a substantial domestic base and not be beholden on our enemies. Two, we're not going to be able to do this in virtually every category. So my next principle is uh, based on the advice of Aristotle that the mark of political intelligence is to make reasonable distinctions. Meaning when we do outsource, and this is where I think Trump his, he, Jim Mattis understands the importance of democratic allies. President Trump could do better rhetorically, at least. When we do outsource, it should be to decent democratic allies. Mm. And, and, and if I had two words to say about this, decouple from China, engage India. Mm. Th that is the essence of a strategy. When you outsource, you want it to be reliable because short-term market thinking, remember Adam Smith again, markets for them to work depends on the rule of law, courts, property, dealing with a tyranny is, is not a true market situation. So to apply a domestic model without taking into account Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments mm -hmm. and the prerequisites for markets to work, really misunderstands markets. Uh, and, and that's why I think it's wrong to consider Trump a categorical protectionist. Larry Kudlow is one of his principal economic advisors. And what Trump has done is to say, here's my market guy, but here's Peter Navarro, my national security guy, and it's balance. So too often we, we reduce good. this to a binary choice. And so to the questions on economics, one, yes, we're going to move more back. We should. And when we don't, it should be to friendly countries and the places we shouldn't invest in are, are our worst enemies. I mean, anybody who's investing in China, North Korea, Russia, Iran, and Cuba, they're undermining national security and markets, rightly understood. So another good question um, here from, I'll just call out Eric Alum, thank you for joining us, is um, looking through this coronavirus, the pandemic, um, in, in another way as it relates to China, wondering actually, could this set up the downfall of China? Could this blunt 
their global ambitions, even as they are dropping masks that don't work all over the world and other places. Is there a way that whether this was intentional or not, this the, the virus and how it got started, actually could this have a serious negative blowback on China? In the long term, if we handle it right, although the Chinese are trying to dissimulate and some countries like Italy are gullible enough initially to believe it, I think the long-term effect on this will be harmful to China. And I'm not of the school that China is inevitably number one, quite the contrary. Uh, my greatest fear, and it's a fear of Arthur Waldron, Gordon Chang, um, and, and Aaron Freeberg and other China hawks, is not that China is going to be number one, but they're going to learn the way the Soviet Union did, that they're going to be, there's going to be a reckoning. We cannot combine innovation with the monopoly of the Communist Party. And when that moment comes, I want China to face a Reagan deterrent mm. rather than a Carter Obama deterrent, because countries in that situation facing long-term pessimism and a short-term opportunity, look at the Imperial Japanese in 1941, often try to get out of their dilemma. I want them to face an America so strong, so robust, so clear and capable that when the Pilot Bureau decided in 1985 to choose Gorbachev, they said niet to expansion, and I want the Chinese to, to do the same thing. So if we play our cards right, uh, China should be weakened by this, but never underestimate the capacity for gullibility. If you mm. read the, the elite journals these days, it's woe is me, China is, is ahead of the curve. I listened to Richard Haas, head of foreign relations, chairman of the Council of Foreign Relations, hail China for uh, the way they've handled this and criticize Trump, quote unquote, for racism, calling this uh, the the coronavirus. So, so never underestimate the gullibility of progressives. Having said that, I think objectively when the dust settles with ups and downs, this will expose to people what is the ghost of Christmas future of what a Chinese world will be. It's a world of repressing its Muslims, suppressing free speech in Hong Kong, and also lying about a pandemic that affected literally the entire world. The, the Chinese, we really are honest, um, did the equivalent of dropping a neutron bomb on Silicon Valley. It's their responsibility. They compounded it and um, maximized the breadth and depth of the suffering. And if we don't learn from this, uh, it, it's Einstein's definition of insanity or attributed wrongly to Einstein doing the same thing again, expecting something different. So we just have a couple minutes here, uh, Professor Kaufman. And uh, so I just wanted to close with one question that actually is gonna set up one of the uh, future sessions here. And again, this is just session one of four. Uh, we'll be conducting these on Fridays, uh, this same time live from Malibu, um, is India. Um, and, and India's role as, uh, obviously, it's, it's obvious in his visit to India, on uh, Modi's visit to the United States, that there's a relationship there that's not just national, but it, it almost seems personal. Uh, going forward, especially as it relates to supply chains, what, what do you think the role of India is in our uh, geopolitical relationships. Uh, huge. And I, I think this is something I've emphasized in my writing. And let me emphasize, and I think, again, Trump's instincts are better than sometimes they sound. Sometimes President Trump goes too far with the uh, trade, meaning he doesn't make reasonable distinctions. Because in India, there are problems. They are protectionist. Do you really want to press the issue with India the way you want to press the issue with China, or do you want to make reasonable distinctions, as we did during the Cold War, that we can live with a little more from India in terms of uh, trade because of the benefits we get overall because we have open societies 
see the world the same way on the threat of radical Islam and also on the uh, threat of China. Here's a caveat, uh, don't expect more than India can deliver. One, there's a deep tradition of non-alignment, so our cooperation is more gonna be more quasi rather than formal. And two, Modi has his own problems. Um, things have not progressed as optimistically, but overall, India is the most important relationship that we can cultivate um, in the Indo-Pacific along with Japan. And I give President Trump a great deal of credit for uh, reviving this initiative that uh, George W. Bush wisely initiated and President Obama let languish. Well, Dr. Kaufman, thank you so much for this time. This uh, is takes us to the end, uh, 1230 here Pacific time. I wanna thank you all for joining us. Again, this is just the first Friday of a series of four where we'll be co conducting these online sessions. Uh, we have classroom space available. And so for all of you, fee please feel free to uh, spread the word to your networks about this, although we've got a lot of great signups here. Uh, following this session, within 24 hours, uh, Melissa will be sending you out a link to the uh, recorded version of the session, along with a couple other links uh, to the specific books that Dr. Kaufman referenced uh, today. So again, I hope uh, these sessions are providing a little bit of a, a bright light in your day. Uh, we know that these are, uh, that we are living history in so many ways, um, but at the same time, there are opportunities here to learn, and uh, we certainly want to be a part of that learning experience for all of you. So with that, thank you, and goodbye from Malibu. Hope to see you next Friday.